am the most beautiful woman in the world. <laughs> yes, you are. So, what I've got here tonight, and can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yeah. What I've got here tonight are some thoughts about rich old hippies, sex, and drugs. Hey, I'm in. <laughs> I've got a thing for rich old hippies. It dates back to when I was a child in the suburbs of Chicago, and I watched a movie or a TV show about Woodstock, and these were people who were older than me, taking drugs, dancing to rock music, and wearing trippy clothes with long fringes and psychedelic prints, and then they would rip the clothes off and roll around naked in the mud. Well, as a child of the suburbs, I thought it was all very scary and charming and foreign, and I just figured those hippies were rich because they had the means to get to New York and buy those fabulous clothes and those scary drugs. Now, more recently, I was staying at a villa in the south of France, and I was at a house party that lasted several weeks. So, one fine evening before dinner, we were sipping rosé from Provence and sitting on the terrace that overlooked the swimming pool and the vineyards and the Sedan Mountains in the distance, and the richest and oldest hippie amongst us, a 74-year-old English lady named Imogen, stood and she made an announcement. And this will be me trying to imitate Imogen's posh English accent. Unfortunately, Ryan Eyre have a very strict baggage policy, and so I was unable to transport any cocaine or hashish in my little bag when I flew to Nîmes Airport <coughs> last week. And so instead, I would like to invite everybody to a luncheon tomorrow at the Auberge de Bain. I love Imogen, and you would too if you met her, and I'm writing a novel that um, features her as the inspiration of one of my characters who just happens to be named Imogen. <laughs> what a coincidence. <laughs> Mind you, in her 74 years, Imogen hasn't always been a rich hippie. Back in the 1970s, she was a conservative candidate who stood for election to the House of Commons, and she hoped to represent her district in Nottinghamshire where her family had a stately home they have been living there for a million years. It's probably a good thing that Imogen didn't become a conservative MP because her daughter took her to India and turned her on to yoga and drugs, and Imogen doesn't really give a fuck about politics. <laughs> oh, it would, be, it would be marvelous to go back to Goa they have the most lovely opium dens there. <laughs> anyway. I recently read an essay by the neurologist Oliver Sacks. He wrote a personal history about his experiments in the chemistry of LSD, morphine, chloral hydrate, and morning glory seeds. Morning glory seeds. Now, this was going on in the early 60s when Oliver Sacks was a medical student, and he's also English, coincidentally, and um, I'm not going to attempt his accent, but um, maybe the English are just good at being rich old hippies. I don't know. But um, this is what Oliver Sacks wrote. I recall vividly one episode in which a magical color appeared to me I had long wanted to see true indigo and thought that drugs might be the way to do this. So one sunny Saturday in 1964, I developed a pharmacologic launch pad consisting of a base of amphetamine for general arousal, LSD for hallucinogenic intensity, and cannabis for a little added delirium. <laughs> About 20 minutes after, a, um, after I took this, I faced a white wall and explained. 
I want to see indigo now. Now! And then, as if thrown by a giant paintbrush, there appeared a huge, trembling, pear-shaped blob of the purest indigo. Luminous, luminous. It filled me with rapture. It was the color of heaven. I don't know if Oliver Sacks fits the technical definition of a ritual hippie, but he's a best-selling author. He's 80 years old, and he's fantastically eccentric. So uh, that's good enough for me, and that qualifies him. But if you really want a full-on, true blue ritual hippie, you can't do better than Dr. Timothy Leary. <laughs> The man that President Nixon once described as the most dangerous man in America. <laughs> Dr. Leary came from a wealthy family who sent him to the military academy at West Point, but something went wrong and he ended up getting court-martialed and discharged, and this was before he started taking all the LSD. So he studied psychology, <coughs> became a Harvard professor, as you do, and he started taking heavy doses of LSD. During the summer of love in 1968, he was 48 years old, and those teenage runaways in Haight-Ashbury must have thought that Dr. Leary was an ancient guru with his mantra of turn on, tune in, drop out. Turn on, tune in, drop out. Now, Unfortunately, I've never taken any LSD myself, but I do wish I had transported some tablets of LSD in my little bag tonight for everybody here at the Identity Bar Lounge to take, and we could have a bee-in together. Wouldn't that be lovely, darling? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Rick. Uh, let's have a show of hands. Has anybody <laughs> ever taken LSD? Yeah. <laughs> Psilocybin mushrooms? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so I haven't done LSD. I've taken um, mushrooms, but um, that's for my next reading. But for now, let's focus on Dr. Timothy Leary's interview with Playboy magazine in 1966. This was after Harvard kicked him out for taking drugs and a few years before he was sentenced to 30 years in prison. At this point, he had dropped acid about 300 times. Anybody out there taking um, acid more than 300 times? <laughs> They're dead. <laughs> um, oh, this is where I was, I was going to give the plug for Bad Girl Blog, but <laughs> Philip already did it for me. But um, the URL is www.mybadgirlblog.blogspot.com um, So obviously, bad girl blogger, what interested me in Dr. Leary was his thoughts about LSD, women, and sex. It's a mixed bag, this interview, I mean, frankly, it's a mishmash of um, drug experience, scientific wisdom, unfiltered thoughts, and sheer nonsense. For example, I now, I now know that in a carefully prepared, loving LSD session, a woman can have several hundred orgasms. <laughs> I also have learned that every woman has built into her cells and tissues the longing for a hero sage mythic male to open up and share her own divinity. That's a, that's a quote. <laughs> Let me read that again. Every woman has built into her cells and tissues the longing for a hero sage mythic male to open up and share her own divinity. Plus, Dr. Leary says, LSD is a powerful panacea for impotence and frigidity, which, like homosexuality, are symbolic screw-ups. That's also a quote. 
<laughs> Symbolic screw-ups, homosexuality, frigidity, impotence. Uh, so I, it sounds pretty dated. And there's also a funny passage in the interview where Playboy magazine keeps asking Dr. Larry variations of the same question over and over, which is whether it is easier to pick up chicks when you're tripping on LSD. <laughs> so, uh, so how does that work? Um, when you're tripping on LSD, does, is it easier to pick up chicks? Uh, the doctor warns against it. <laughs> saying that on LSD, her eyes would be microscopic, and she'd see very plainly what the guy was up to, coming on with some heavy-handed, mustache-twisting routine. You'd look like a consummate ass, he said, and she'd laugh at you. Or you'd look like a monster, and she'd scream and go into a paranoid state. <laughs> Nevertheless, Timothy Leary was ahead of his time in many ways, and he truly believed that LSD opens a person up to the truth. He said, every man contains the essence of all men, and every woman has within her all women. That's what I love about him, and that's why I'm giving this reading tonight about ritual hippies, and what they can teach us, and the lesson that LSD can teach us. So listen carefully. Every man contains the essence of all men, and every woman has within her all women. Dr. Leary tells Playboy about an LSD session with his wife, Rosemary. Oh, and I asked um, my friends to pass around. I have a picture, of just a printout, of um, Dr. Leary and his wife. And they're a great looking couple. So, um, Dr. Leary tells Playboy about an LSD session with his wife, Rosemary, when their eyes lock and she pulled him into the center of her mind, and he experienced everything she was experiencing. He looked at her face, and it began to melt and change. I saw her as a witch, a Madonna, a nagging crone, a radiant queen, a Byzantine virgin, a tired, worldly-wise oriental whore who had seen every sight of life <laughs> repeated a thousand times. She was all women, all woman, the essence of female, eyes smiling, quizzically, resignedly, devilishly, always inviting. See me, hear me, join me, merge with me, keep the dance going. Mrs. Leary was all women to her husband. He told Playboy that he didn't need a constant, ever-changing parade of young female flesh. During the six-year period of his extravagant, promiscuous, unchaste use of LSD, Dr. Leary was faithful to his wife. He said, the notion of running around trying to find different mates is a very low-level concept. Yes. <laughs> There's something sweetly old-fashioned in Dr. Leary's fidelity to Mrs. Leary. Say what you will about him, and plenty of people have called him a crackpot and a charlatan, but Timothy Leary was a man who loved and cherished his wife. Thank you. Oh. Thank you.